The Regatta Mystery and Other Stories by Agatha Christie, featuring Hercule Poirot and other detectives, including Miss Marple and Parker Pine. Now, what is a regatta? Well, it's some kind of a race involving boats. I've never been to a regatta. I kind of can imagine what it might be like, but I... This was my first opportunity to attend one, but unfortunately there's really no regatta in sight in the title story of this novel. I, there may have been some reference to it, but really, other than possibly taking place on a boat, I don't even remember. The very title of this collection is The First Big Red Herring in the Bunch. Okay, so this is one of the Hercule Poirot short story collections that I skipped over when I was going through the Hercule Poirot books chronologically, uh, since after all, this collection of nine short stories doesn't even only feature Poirot. Actually, only five of the stories feature Poirot, and of the others, two feature Parker Pine, one features Miss Marple, and the final one just features some other random dude. These stories you'll find in The Regatta Mystery and Other Stories are really an assortment, uh, as they feature different detectives and really don't seem to fit together in any clear way. I actually kind of suspect, I hate to say that, uh, these were some of the stories that didn't make the cut for earlier collections because a lot of them are pretty unmemorable and uninspired, at least for Christie's standards. Really though, even some of Christie's other short stories, like those in Poirot Investigates, were never really my favorites. Uh, I feel she shines more in her longer works, or at least the stories of novella length, at least. That's not to say, though, that I didn't enjoy this short story collection. I did. And in fact, one of the biggest mysteries for me was why, at least in my own judgment, the stories generally tend to improve in quality as you proceed through the collection. Uh, the first story and title mystery, The Regatta Mystery, was quite possibly the most boring Agatha Christie story I've ever read. Okay, I may be overstating this, but I was frustrated because in yet another short story featuring, of course, a jewel theft, we're misled by the title itself to believe that there's going to be some kind of excitement involving boat racing, and your imagination might really take off with the possibilities this could offer, but no, this isn't one of Christie's beloved destination mysteries. This is simply a story where maybe the theft takes place on a boat. I don't even recall. And I can't remember because boats were entirely irrelevant to this mystery, even though it was apparently enough to give the entire collection a boat on the cover of the edition that I listened to. Also, did I mention the detective in the story isn't even Poirot? <laughs> no, it's some scrub named Parker Pine, whom I've never seen before, but I guess his thing is that he doesn't catch murderers, he classifies them. If you want a better mystery involving a boat, although still not really anywhere near the best we've seen, skip all the way to the end of the collection for Problem at Sea, in which there's at least some acknowledgement and importance to who is on and off the boat at a given time, and where Paro at least reflects for a bit about how much he hates sailing. Like, you'll actually remember at the end of that story that it was on a boat. The characters in that one, Problem at Sea, weren't altogether memorable to me, but this was at least a mystery where the scenario will have you thinking a bit, as opposed to the regatta mystery where you'll just be wondering in which of the numerous possible ways, none of them particularly impressive, this jewel could have been stolen, all before one of those ways is randomly chosen as the answer. Okay though, so what else did we have in this collection? Uh, there was the mystery of the Baghdad chest. Uh, some people might like this one, and it at least piqued my curiosity far more than the first story. I was trying to come up with theories, uh, but in the end I just found it all to be a little bit too complicated, with numerous possibilities, and with important and entirely conclusion-changing details coming out pretty late in the story. It is possible that the solution revealed at the end is the simplest one fitting all the facts, but only because the facts are so entirely baffling. And that's why I say I think some people might like this one. Uh, it has its merit, but for me this one had me a little too confused confused, uh, as opposed to most of the others in this collection, to really give me that nice aha moment at the end. Next up was How Does Your Garden Grow, which is actually not a bad overall story to read, and it introduces Poirot's secretary, Miss Lemon, but the solution to the mystery was one that I think was just a bit ridiculous. Uh, probably very few people would have guessed it, and I didn't find it particularly satisfying, though it did make for an excellent finale in the TV show adaptation, starring David Suchet as uh, Poirot, which I watched afterwards. Uh, then there's Problem at Palenza Bay, which again was a perfectly okay story to follow, featuring Parker Pine again, uh, but in which the plot revolves entirely around not a mystery, but the problem of how to make everyone happy when a young man and woman are in love, but the young man's mother doesn't approve of this modern woman. And you very well might be able to tell where this one's going by about halfway through. It's not really even a mystery. With Yellow Iris, things 
get a little more interesting, but only in the second half of the story. Meeting the characters here was not really that memorable for me, nor was learning everyone's favorite flower, which seems by the end to be less consequential than we're led to believe. It's when everyone sits down to dinner and the host makes a startling announcement that this one gains steam, even if the solution itself is less memorable than the whole dinner table setup and scenario, which I enjoyed. Miss Marple Tells a Story is another perfectly reasonable crime mystery in which we're trying to figure out who could or couldn't have entered a room to, you know, you know kill the person in it. Uh, the solution, too, is perfectly reasonable, and you might be able to guess it, but even if you can, I don't know if it's one that'll have you jumping for joy in celebration. I mean, pretty ordinary mystery overall, as you might expect for a story with the title, Miss Marple Tells a Story. Now, The Dream. This one was actually interesting, and I'd say if there's one story I'll remember from this collection, this would be the one. Uh, I actually figured out most of the details in this one, which is pretty fun, uh, but even regardless of that, uh, this one was simply a different enough situation to make me actually care right from the start, which is what made it stand out from all the others. In a Glass Darkly definitely surprised me because, well, it wasn't exactly the most perfectly written story I'd ever heard, but it feels more like a gothic-inspired tale than a typical Agatha Christie mystery and it features no whodunit at all. Uh, the actual story itself was nothing particularly special. I was just really surprised to see it because so far I don't think I'd ever read anything by Christie that was this far from a whodunit. Actually, that's not entirely true. I guess her book, The Man in the Brown Suit, which I reviewed a while back on this channel, could also fit that bill, but that was an entirely different direction for Christie to take. And finally, there was Problem at Sea, which I already mentioned. Uh, it was okay, but nothing to get too excited about. If you really want a good story in which the suspects are confined to a boat, uh, I think Death on the Nile wouldn't be a bad place to start. So all in all, a nice little collection, but not what Agatha Christie will be remembered for, certainly not by me at least. It might be partly just because these stories were so short. Even G.K. Chesterton's Father Brown stories, for example, were I think uh, quite a bit longer than these, giving a little more time to establish the scene and the characters so as to make it more memorable. I'm sure it can't be easy, though, to tell a compelling and memorable mystery story in just like 20 pages. And I will at least point out that although a lot of these stories were lackluster, none of them were truly awful in a way that just made me mad or anything. Uh, even the ones I couldn't get into were mildly satisfying. Have you read this collection and were there any of these that stood out for you? Uh, let me know what you thought and sooner or later I'll be back with some more Eric Yulparo readings, hopefully a full-length novel next time, and I hope to see you then.